Kommunistische Organisation Podcast so, uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, episode of our podcast series on imperialism and war. I'm Max, uh, and together with Anselm, I will be the moderator today. Today's topic has resulted uh, from a reading circle on the question of imperialism in the 21st century. In the beginning of 2022, our organization has decided uh, to devote itself to clarifying the question of imperialism, because the crisis of the communist movement is shown in this question in particular. Capitalism is once again in a deep crisis and the imperialist powers are pushing for a redivision of the world. The communist movement must overcome this crisis and lead the struggle against imperialism. That's why we have a special guest today. Uh, we are really happy to welcome Harpal Pra. Hello, Harpal. Hi, comrade. Um, yeah, I'll start with a short introduction um, about Harpal Pra. He was born in India and has lived in Britain since 1962. And since uh, 79, he has been the editor of the anti-imperialist journal Lalka. He has been one of the founding members of the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist-Leninist, which he has been the chairman of for 14 years. Over the last decades, he has written multiple books on the topic of imperialism, but also on the counter-revolution in the Soviet Union and on Trotskyism. His books, Perestroika, The Complete Collapse of Revisionism, and Imperialism, Decadent, Parasitic, Morbid Capitalism, have been published also in German. You can find a review on the later on our website. Um, now uh, to the first point. During the last months, we could see how the question of the assessment of imperialism drove a wedge into the communist movement. An expression of this are, among others, the two opposing resolutions during the international meeting of the Communist and Workers' Parties in Havana and Cuba. Some communist parties argue that there is no more an essential division into dependent and imperialist states, but that all capitalist states are acting within an imperialist world system, since no country can escape the development of monopolies towards imperialism, and that colonialism is a relic of the past. In their theory, these parties essentially refer to the law of inequality of the economic and political development of the capitalist countries. For example, our podcast of Andreas Sörensen, the chairman of the Swedish Communist Party, showed this understanding. In your book, Imperialist, Decadent, Parasitic, Morbid Capitalism, you, like Lenin has done in his work on imperialism, distinguish between major imperialist powers and dependent countries. Can you uh, maybe briefly explain again why you stick to the division into oppressive and oppressed countries and whether there are other categories besides these two as a start? Well, it, it, it seems to me, it turns to be anybody who's even uh, uh, has a cursory acquaintance with the world that we live in, th there is a distinction between imperialist countries and the oppressed countries. Uh, imperialist countries, um, not only economically exploit the dependent countries, but also militarily oppress them. And any uh, um, non-imperialist country that tries to follow an independent foreign and economic policy is made the subject of re regime change by means peaceful and not very peaceful. You only have to look at the wars uh, uh, against, against U Yugoslavia and and, and the wars waged against people of Afghanistan, people of Iraq, and subsequently people of Libya, people of Syria, um, and, and presently the genocidal war going on in Yemen. All these are examples of oppressed countries being targeted by imperialism, whether directly or through their, 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 their proxies. Uh, to me, you have to be really blind and, 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 and not be able to see at all to be able to say this just because these countries are capitalist and many of these countries are not even properly capitalist they are still in a pre pre -cap capitalist state but the basic thing is they're trying to liberate themselves from the shackles of finance capital which actually subjugates them 
to 1,001 threats binds them to, to, to imperialist countries, um, whether it is through debt, debt slavery, through financial institutions of imperialism, like the International Monetary Fund or, or the World Bank, uh, or, or, or individual banks in the, in the, in the, in the imperialist countries. So these countries really uh, are struggling hard and that's precisely what imperialism is, is frightened of. That's why they're prepared to put so many resources in order to be able to sub, subdue those, 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 those countries. And for example, take, take the question of Syria. Um, the R R Russians came to the help of the Syrians and thwarted US and other imperialist countries attempt to, to have a re regime change in, in, in Syria. And straight away, Putin became the target of attack by imperialism. He straight away became a, became a dictator. Um, but as long as Russia was compliant with what was required of it, for example, during the period of uh, the not so very sober Yeltsin, they were very happy. Russia was uh, there, but they were hoping through very peaceful means to divide up Russia into several digestible parts. Russia is a very big country. Whatever its social system, it's very difficult to subdue Russia. 200 years history of Russia proves that it's not possible to subdue Russia. And it's exactly the same with China. The Chinese are offering an alternative uh, to the imperialist um, model of, of, of development through the Belt and Road Initiative and various other projects which are arranged between China and individual individual countries. And precisely for that reason, Chinese are popular with the countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And precisely for that reason, they've been made the target by imperialism, particularly by, by US imperialism, which is trying to thwart the economic development of, of China. But it will be no more successful than 100 years earlier. Britain was successful in thwarting the economic development of, of America. Uh, America, which was developed with, with, with British capital, you know, after the war of independence against Britain by, by America, uh, once uh, uh, it took a while before Britain accepted that America had become independent. For example, in 1812, it bombarded the White, White House. People forget that that's what Britain used to do, do to, Amer to America. But once it became clear that America was there to stay, then Britain changed its tack and poured a lot of money into America, um, developed America, and of course made a lot of money by doing that. In exactly the same way, the American and other imperialist countries have exported a lot of capital to China. And in doing so, they have helped to develop China's economy because they're making a lot of money. But of course, they suddenly realize, hey, China is becoming what, what, what John Mearsheimer, the professor from Chicago, says, a peer competitor. And they're trying, every one of them, America, Germany, Britain, to thwart China development. And then this produces problems even within their own bourgeoisie. There's a lot of bourgeois in these countries who are making a lot of money out of China. They don't want to be disengaged from China. But the geopolitical uh, thinkers of the ruling class think it's not a, it's not a good idea. So I really don't think anybody can deny the difference between oppressed nations and oppressive nations. How many oppressed nations do you think come to bomb America, to bomb Germany, to bomb Britain? But these countries are constantly bombing these countries. That's a perfectly good example of the relationship between the oppressing and oppressed nations, between imperialist countries and non-imperialist countries, even in Europe. If a country wants to follow independent policy and it's not a properly imperialist country like Yugoslavia was, the result was that Yugoslavia was split into six different countries um, with the recognition by Germany, for example, of Croatia and Slovenia. And the ball was set rolling and it led to over a decade of imperialist inspired civil wars which claimed the lives of tens of thousands, thousands of people it led to the overthrow of the Milosevic regime. I don't hold any brief for the Milosevic regime, but the fact is it was targeted, not because it was pro-imperialist, but because it wanted to maintain an, its own independent policy. Uh, 
whether it be on the question of Kosovo or, or any, anything else. Yeah, you already mentioned uh, a few of the points that we uh, can maybe go back to um, during the later parts of the podcast, but I'll try to stick uh, to the point of uh, assessing uh, different countries, since I think for a lot of people, uh, oppressed countries is connected to an understanding of countries near a colonial state. And on a surface level, um, there is no more uh, the colonial system of the past that we see uh, today. And for them, that means that, of course, we cannot uh, speak of oppressed uh, countries. So um, maybe you could go into um, yeah, a, a presentation or a, a bit of a discourse on um, what about uh, yeah, the countries um, that have a relative uh, economic um, independence, uh, at least as it seems on the surface level, um, and maybe also go uh, a bit on the description of uh, maybe how we could um, characterize the term of semi-colonies, uh, which Lenin has uh, used for a variety of countries um, that are not near the uh, colonial status? Well, the word semi-colony was used by, by Lenin in regard to two or three countries that had not been fully occupied by colonial powers. And the best example of that was China. China was a semi-colony because although the imperialists had various in interests and many of them controlled some of the seaports, ports of China. Germany had uh, had some ports near Shandong. Brit Britain had Hong Kong and a number of other places. So did America. Even minor countries like 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 Dan Denmark, etc. Uh, had a go. The the Tsarist uh, Russian Russians had. So um, they, that was a semi colony. And China escaped the full colonial status precisely because imperialist powers could not agree with each other. By the time China, China's colonization became a, uh, came on the order of the day, the imperialist powers could not agree how to divide divide China, and, uh, and then, then, then of course there were uh, uh, real differences, and eventually a war between imperialist countries, like for example between Japan Japan and America, uh, uh, ultimately. But it's also a fallacy to think that you have got to be a complete colony before you can be de de defined as an uh, independent country. Lenin in his own day said, yes, of course, imperialism likes to have full domination and colonial status of a country ensures the complete dominance of the dominating po power. But that's not necessary. And he particularly gives an example of Argentina, which Lenin said, citing a bourgeois political economist, I think it was a French person, Trio or something, that Latin America, for all purposes, for notwithstanding its political independence, is a financial colony of, of Britain. So you can be that because you're beholden to them through the uh, workings of finance capital. So it's not necessary. And also, of course, uh, a new term has come since the way of political independence in the aftermath of the Second World War. And that term is a new colony. So you're not a semi-colony because nobody's uh, half occupying your country. Although some of it continues in some, some forms, for example, uh, in, the, in countries like Angola and Mozambique, imperialism through South Africa occupied parts of these countries. But even if they have no foreign soldiers on their territory, they nevertheless have become, if you like, new colonies new type of colonies which are subjugated by the economic relations of, of, of imperialism through finance, finance capital. And as Lenin said, finance capital is such a force that there is not a square inch of the world where it has not put its heavy, heavy boot. And you have, for example, a country like Pakistan. It's got very close economic relationships and relationship with China. With China. And get a lot of economic and, uh, and 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 other forms of help from China. All the same, when it's in financial trouble, it's, it's obliged to go to the International Monetary Fund 
And imperialism insists that if it wants to come there, it must actually loosen its ties with China. That's one of the considerations that constantly puts. So even countries that have close relationship with China don't easily escape the heavy and burdensome boot of imperialism. I don't know if I've answered your question, Roger. Yeah, that uh, was a good start. Um... So uh, maybe uh, you could go into detail which criteria you uh, use to identify these countries as um, not only uh, oppressed and um, oppressing, but also now you introduced uh, the term neocolonialism and uh, countries in a neocolonial state. So maybe you could um, go a bit uh, into uh, which also leads us to Uh, the developments uh, that have happened since the book uh, and the categories to assess uh, different countries and the imperialist system? Well, I mean, you only have to look at the economic relationship with these countries. Ask yourself a very important question. Which of these countries exports capital to the other? Uh, so you will find all the imperialist countries are exporting capital. To, to these countries, call them oppressed, call them neocolonial, whatever you will. And they are constantly in the business of receiving capital investment. They, I, 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 but I mean, every country in the world has some monopoly corporation. Saudi Arabia, for example, has the largest Uh, uh, corporation in the world and its oil corporation is the largest oil corporation. Saudi Ar 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 Aramco is the world. But you would not call Saudi Arabia an imperialist country. It has to my knowledge up to now been completely dependent on US imperialism whose military, diplomatic and economic support it has needed in order to be able to survive in that 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 Uh, part of the world. It's not because Iran is threatening it. It's because it's frightened of its own people. Um, and so they are in alliance with imperialism. And the very countries that struggle against feudalism, you know, European countries, American, America, etc., in the sordid interests of its fin finance magnates, makes an alliance with the most backward forces in the world to keep that, that, that system going. And that's precisely why they support all these monarchies in, in, in the Middle East, whether it's Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates and some very small places like Qatar. I mean, you could basically describe these countries as oil wells with a flag and a constitution written by the imperial, power, imperial powers. So having money does not by itself guarantee that you are independent and you are not actually part of the maneuvers of the imperialist countries who actually turn you, notwithstanding your wealth, into a new, new colony. But these, these countries with a lot of wealth are only few and far between. Many more are those which have no such resources and they constantly have to rely to develop their economies on what is known as imperialist aid. Well, that's really if in fact an aid to imperialism rather than imperialists giving aid to these countries and enter into unequal treaties uh, whereby uh, capital is exported to these countries. And very often it does not lead to any economic development. It is put into extractive industries. And after a decade or so, the imperialists leave these countries, not with development, but with large number of holes in the ground where the minerals have been extracted and nothing much is left. And one of the reasons they hate China is that when, and even some honest bourgeois writers have admitted, when China goes to these countries, it leaves behind a school, a university, roads, other infrastructure, some, some, some industry, some institutions for looking after, after people, people's health. There are some big countries, India, Brazil, South Africa, Russia, which have monopolies of their own. But none of that makes them into imperialist countries. Although, for example, Britain is one of the largest, uh, India is one of the largest investors in Britain. 
but still the relationship is not that of e e e e e equals. It is still subject to all, all, all sorts of con 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 conditions. Britain can terminate that, that relationship at a moment's notice if, we, if it finds convenient, like America is doing with China. Uh, you know, it would not uh, let their corporation sell any advanced technology to, to China. It sometimes even prevents them from trading because they can't compete with China. So they find their idea of free trade is to prevent China from trading at all. Uh, so that, that shows the difference between an imperialist and a non-imperialist -imperial, countries. Um, whatever your views of China, I mean, you know, uh, at the moment we're not discussing that. But the fact of the matter is, China has become irksome. China is a thorn in the side of imperialism because it provides an alternative to other countries. If China is investing in the oil industry in Venezuela, it's not to the liking of America. America has wanted to overthrow the Maduro regime for years and years, and before that, the, the, the government of Hugo Chavez. It hasn't been able to, and now for its own selfish reasons, it's been sending its representatives to ask Venezuela to start pumping more oil and send, it, send them to America because they need it, because of their war against, against Russia. I would like to follow up, follow up with some questions on uh, the development since uh, the publication of your book, um, because we can see um, some uh, developments that um, have come up since uh, 1997. And uh, for example, if we look at the US, uh, you can see a slow decline in the economy. And also uh, you can see that in a military way, they uh, they start or um, uh, partly losing wars like uh, they went out of uh, Afghanistan. And um, what would you say, what shifts do happen in the power positions of various imperialist countries and um, which one have occurred since then? For example, if we talk about the rise of the BRICS states, well, when I wrote my, my book, the biggest rival to American imperialism was considered to be Japan. You know, Japan had racked up oh, a cumulative um, uh, savings of over a trillion dollars, capped mainly million, million dollars and, and invested in America. America, on the other hand, was a big, big debtor. And there were a number of books published at that time um, and one of them, the most famous, was the coming war with Japan. Uh, everybody expected that there'd be a war between America and Japan because Japan was getting too big for its boots and its economic power was increasing. But then, because Japan, notwithstanding all that, is still an occupied country since the Second, Second World War, there are tens of thousands of American troops stationed in Japan, as they are in South Korea, as they are in Europe, principally in, Ge in, in, in Germany. So these countries are very much under the control of America and America can manipulate their economic policy. It was able to force Japan to revalue its yen at the, pl at the Plaza Agri Agreement and the Japanese economy having accepted that has never recovered from it. You see now in, in Germany, Germany is a powerful country is the most powerful and highly industrialized country in, in, in Europe. It should be able to stand up to America, but it doesn't because it still is living in the past. It still feels a threat from, from communist Russia. Although communist Russia posed no threat to Germany, it had no intention of, of, of invading Germany. And through that, America is able to manipulate. And now it is actually intent, this war, of NATO. Now it's not only against Russia, which it is, but it's also a war against Germany. They want to eliminate Germany as a competitor. It's a very competent industrial power and they want to eliminate that. They want to, Germany's prosperity was built on cheap import, uh, imports of Russian gas and a market in Russia and a market in China. And America wants to cut all that 
and substitute the gas in Russia with liquefied, liquef liquefied natural gas from America transported at high cost, which will actually finish off G German industry and not to actually uh, uh, work in the markets of China and, and, and Russia, for which there is no substitute. These are two such big markets and Germany was well placed to actually have a reasonable relationship with both Russia and with China, and they want to finish that. So there's no friend of US imperialism in the world. What US imperialism cares for is its own interests. So imperialist countries have themselves a pecking order. They're all imperialists. They all want to do down China and Russia, but their interests diverge. How long it will carry on, I do not know. But if the war in Ukraine goes as I think it's going, and it's completely contrary to the narrative that you get in your press, whether you read the Build or whether you, we get the Financial Times uh, uh, or the Guardian or, or, or Times, you would think Russia has lost the war. Well, if Russia has lost the war, why do you keep on sending weapons? Why do you say it needs more weapons? It hasn't lost the war because Russia is able to produce its weapons, whereas the European countries are running out of stocks because the, the, the whole idea of producing anything, including military material, is to have a just-in-time system of production and making the maximum of money. And it doesn't always suit to have long-term planning for these. The Russians have prepared for this day when they would have to fight against NATO. NATO has been fighting against Russia not since February of 2022, but since 2014, at least, if not 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 earlier, since the, uh, the, the 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 Maidan coup in that country, which installed a fascist junta supported by those who actually fought on the side of German armed forces during during the Second World War, the Hitlerites. Uh, and yet, this is fought in the name of human values, in the name of democracy, in the name of rule of law. But they are not at all ashamed of supporting the fascists in order to be able to control Ukraine, Ukraine as an instrument of waging war against Russia. They don't give a damn that they would fight to the last Ukrainian to fight against Russia. They're not worried about, uh, about Ukraine. Ukraine is not fighting. If it's fighting for their values, these values are fascistic. <laughs> you know, but that is what the public in our countries need, need, need to be told. It needs to be told. It's not an imperialist war. Uh, the comrade earlier, uh, Max mentioned the two views in the International Conference of Communist and Workers' Parties. Well, in my view, the view that holds that it's an interference war is completely wrong, and it needs to be refuted, and it needs to be shown to be, to, be, to, be, to be wrong. Its refutation must come, not only from the Communist Party of Great Britain, Marxist Leninists, but from all the Marxist Leninists everywhere, including Greece, including Italy, including Germany, including America, wherever you can, can think of it. It's the job of the proletarian revolutionaries and the international proletariat to oppose that line. It's a Trotskyist line. You know, it's not even a revisionist line. It's a Trotskyist line because Trotskyism stands for counter-revolution everywhere. As Stalin rightly said, at one time, Trotskyism was a tendency, albeit an erroneous one in the working class movement. But since, since 1927, he said, it has become a tool of imperialism and an agency for proving imperialist ideology among the working class everywhere and disrupting the working class movement. That's what they're doing. That's what the Trotskyists in, in, in my, my, my country, uh, which happens to be Britain, even though I don't look very Brit British, uh, that, that's what they've been doing for quite some time. And by doing so, they disarm the working class, they confuse the working class. The idea is nobody should take a correct line because that could hurt imperialism. Their job is not to fight against imperialism, but to actually safeguard imperialist interests because they're petty bourgeois whose own privileges are very much dependent on the maintenance of imperialist system. Super profits from which, some of which come their way 
and maintain their standard of life, the standard of living, without imperialism, they, they could, not, could not be maintained. I would like to quickly come back to the conflicting relationship of uh, Germany and uh, the USA, uh, because some communists in Germany argued that uh, the war in Ukraine is mainly about Germany that wants to act in, on an equal footing with the USA and is therefore pushing economically towards the East, while the US wants to cut the link between Germany and Russia uh, on raw materials. And I think uh, you mentioned some interesting and um, important points already, but I would like to ask you, um, what do you think is the central antagonist uh, on the USA today? What is the central? The central antagonist to the USA. Well, I mean, all bourgeois are opposed to Russia. All bourgeois are opposed to China. But having said that, they have different in, 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 in interests. For example, prior to the Second World War, every imperialist country hated the Soviet Union, the only socialist country at that time, more than anything else. And it would have been their dear wish that there should be a war between Hitlerite -right Germany and Soviet Union, and Soviet Union should be defeated. It didn't work out. And they were able to have a temporary alliance with the Soviet Union, not because of the love of communism, not because of the love of Stalin. They did that because their interests diverged from those of Hitlerite Germany. Hitlerite Germany was after their colonies, after their spheres of influence, after their areas of in investment, after their markets. So they had to protect that and were forced, having tried their very level best to come to terms with, with Germany, to fight against it. And exactly the same thing has happened. The German bourgeoisie is no less anti-Russian and anti-Chinese than the so-called lovers of peace, the green, Greens in your country and others. It is just, just as opposed to, but the German bourgeoisie is able to calculate where its interests lie. It is able to calculate where it makes money. The bourgeoisie's job is to make money. And, and therefore, the German bourgeoisie realizes that not an alliance, but a relationship, a workable relationship with, 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 with Russia, as well as China, is in, it, is, is in its interest. In my view, notwithstanding the statements that she has recently made, that we only entered into the Minsk agreement to give time to, 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 um, uh, to the Ukrainians to be able to build up their armed forces. We never intended to carry out those, 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 those agreements. I think that is something that she has said in response to the very heavy criticism that came that, that she uh, uh, had, had not fought against uh, Russia hard. But the fact of the matter is Merkel understood that the relationship with Russia was useful and Germany could not live on the continent of Europe by constantly being a, an opponent and a fighter, fighter against, against Russia. So these interests are, are there and German bourgeoisie understands that. And until he was forced and had his arm really twisted, Schultz understood it too, but Schultz is a very weak leader. I think he's also very dim. He's not very intelligent. He's not very clever. And I'm not anti-German because there are plenty of clever Germans. But he's just damn stupid. Who would want to destroy their own economy in order to fight for the glory of Uncle Sam and US imperialism, which is what is happening right now? Um, there's also another uh, tool, I would say, that um, we can see the USA used against uh, Russia in, in the war in Ukraine, and uh, that is uh, SWIFT, uh, because when we read your book, uh, you were mainly talking about uh, the IMF and debts uh, when it comes to dependencies, but um, I was wondering whether also um, a tool like SWIFT or uh, Uh, free trade agreements can be used um, to uh, keep some countries in uh, dependence. Um, because um, for me, uh, it seemed like uh, that uh, SWIFT was a precise weapon with the aim of completely disconnecting the Russian economy from the sphere of influence of the West and thereby uh, destroying it economically. What would you say? What are... Um, 
like uh, tools like SWIFT and free trade agreements there for? Well, very much. I mean, you're absolutely right. I agree with you that that, that, is, that is what it was. Precisely for that re reason, uh, Putin's Russia could not stand up to America while these things were there. So since 2014, Russia, as well as China, have been building alternative systems of, of payment. Because if you can't conduct financial transactions, you cannot conduct foreign trade. And at the moment, what is happening is that increasingly foreign trade all, uh, almost imperceptibly is moving away from, from dollar-denominated trading. Can, could you have imagined even three, four years ago that Saudi Arabia would be prepared to discuss how to de-dollarize de its export of oil? Uh, the dollar's hegemony is very much based on the pricing of oil. If oil is priced in dollar, dollars, everybody needs to have dollars to buy oil. And America gets a, gets a free ride. It's the biggest debtor country in the world, and yet it's able to weaponize its debt as a tool of mani 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 manipulation. All the countries who put their money in America now have begun to realize, after they confiscated the Libyan uh, 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 sovereign fund, after they confiscated ben Venezuela's sovereign fund, and more importantly, Russia's, Russia is not a small country. You can't twist Russia's arm. They, 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 they confiscated that, uh, you know, nearly 300 billions of Russian sovereign fund wealth deposited in, in, in American uh, equities and, uh, and bank banks, etc. People are realizing they're not willing to put money into that. Even countries like India, which are supposed to be part of the Quad, Australia, you know, India, uh, 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 and, and, and New, New, New Zealand, uh, uh, Britain, and America. Even India, you know, the Indian foreign minister said the other day, you must get rid of the mindset whereby your problems are our problems, but our problems are our problems. We buy oil from Russia because it suits us. It's the best bargain for us. We buy oil at discounted prices. We need it for our development. We buy coal. We buy all sorts of things for Russia. We have a long-standing relationship with Russia. But of course, India is a big country. America cannot tomorrow start waging also another fight, fight, fight against, against India. But make no mistake, if it carries on like that, they will. You know, they're not friends of India. And it would be stupid for the Indian ruling classes to think that we've got a real friend in Washington. Washington is nobody's friend, either of its own workers at home out of the oppressed people abroad. That, 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 that's my view. And the Chinese and the Russians have built a different system of payments. What's more, they're prepared to deal with each other in trade relations in their own currencies. Now, why do you have to do, do it in dollars? Small countries that try to move away from the dollar, Libya and Iraq, for instance, were made targets of regime change through armed force. But America cannot send an armed force to India and hope to win. You know, it'll be engulfed in a people's war and a conventional war. And the people of India, as Chairman Mao used to say, the people of the world, if America carries on with its aggressive policies, would hang it by the neck. And this, this will happen. In, since 1945, there's not a single war that America has waged which has won. 1950 to 53 against Korea, genocidal war which killed 4 million Korean people. People thought America had learned its lesson. All the petty bourgeois were telling us America has learned its less lessons. It will never send its army anywhere else. Five years later, Vietnam. They lose in Vietnam. Do they stop it? No. Somewhere else, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen. They, they're carrying on in the survey. And they will carry on like that. You know, they, of course, they use, again, to use Masterton's phrase, they have priest-like deception and, you know, butcher-like butcher butcher refreshment. You know, they've got honey on their lips and dagger in their, <laughs> under their jacket. And that's, that's what they are. And the sooner people realize the nature of imperialism, you know, you cannot be choosers in this fight. You can't say Russia is bourgeois. We won't side with Russia. Well, who are you going to side with? You know, you're not going to side with some small 
insignificant country which is not able to fight just because it gives the right slogans. You've got to have, build the widest possible front, anti-imperialist front, which actually will help us to defeat, defeat imperialism. That is the only way to do that. You know, you can sort out their own differences with each, each country. I would, would find its own way to development and its own way to have a social system. In the end, I haven't got the slightest doubt. I've never wavered in this, deter, this optimism of mine. The future belongs to communism. It doesn't belong to capitalism. But the question is, how do you reach there? And you can only reach there by defeating imperialism. At the present time, the most important question facing the working class is twofold. To fight against the cost of living crisis at home, that's in the imperial countries, and to fight against the attempts by imperialism to subjugate Russia, to, to divide it into digestible parts, and to have a regime change in Moscow. If that was to happen, or the similar thing was to happen in China, it will put the working class movement by another 30 years backward, as indeed the collapse of the Soviet, Soviet Union did. That doesn't mean that one spoke to the revisionist Soviet Union, but all the same, it was a better place than what you have got since, since then. So we've got to learn from historical lessons and we've got to fight against the main enemy of the people of the world, which since the Second World War has been imperialism led by US, US imperialism. In the next issue of our newspaper, I'll publish something which comes from the 50s, a document where the Soviet Union was saying, America, through the martial aid, by giving small amounts of money, has bought the whole of Europe. And that's precisely what, what it did. Americans own huge amounts of industry. It's a debtor country. And yet it owns so much of industry in, in Europe and, and elsewhere. It's been able to buy the, the, these places. So the sooner the day of confiscation arrives, the better we shall be. I have one last question on the topic of uh, dependencies, because um, there are some um, communists that believe that uh, China and Russia are imperialist countries, and they argue that, for example, the role of Russia and Syria is in their own economic interest, and also the role that plays um, China and Africa with, for example, the New Silk Road is um, mainly in their economic um, interest. And Undoubtedly, the, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, what's your opinion on, on these arguments and that beliefs? Well, neither Russia nor China or nor any other country are charitable institutions. If you have trade relations, both sides gain. The question is, what is the nature of the relationship? Is it on more equal terms? than the relation these countries have had with imperialism. I mean, what exactly is it that China and Russia have, what China has got out of Syria? In my view, not much. You know, it made itself unpopular with US imperialism and other imperialist countries, but it saved the Syrian regime because it came to the help of a country that had asked for help. It didn't go and impose its help on Syria. Syria asked, asked, asked for that help. And Syrians are very great, grateful. You have to ask the Syrians, do they think Russia takes a lot out of them? And I, I'm pretty sure they'll tell you, no, this is, this is not true. Likewise, the African countries um, have very cordial relations with China. And that was clear when, for example, I continue to follow the Russian uh, way of describing the present war. They call it special military operation. I think it is definitely a good term because they didn't go to subjugate Ukraine. They didn't go there to conquer Ukraine. They went there with two aims, to denazify de Ukraine and to demilitarize <laughs> Ukraine. Ukraine was being militarized since at least 2014, if not earlier, as a means of using it for war against, against, against Russia. And Russians carried on watching all these developments, developments that went contrary to the promises that Russia had been given by the US administration successively, that it will not move an inch, uh, and would not move NATO an inch towards Russia after the fall of the Berlin Wall, which I think was a tragedy for not only Europe, but particularly for Germany. The best thing that the German people have ever achieved 
was the GDR. I don't know whether you agree with me. I do not know your party's policy. I think it was the best thing. And people who think Germany was just a tool, uh, GDR was just a tool for Soviet social, whatever they, they, they call it, is absolute nonsense. It was a part of Germany which hardly had any natural resources. It was highly industrialized, but the Americans and the British realizing that this would be soon uh, liberated by the Red Army, they bombed its industry. Dresden is a perfectly good example. Dresden did not need to be bombed. Hitler was being defeated. Why should the residents of Dresden be punished for just being Germans? So they destroyed the, the, the whole of Dresden, Dresden. Nothing was left to it. All of that was built by the ingenuity of the people of GDR and the help that they, they, they received from, 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 the, from, the, from the Soviet Union, that it became one of the 10 largest economies in the world, this tiny little place, bereft of natural resources. It, its standard of living was so good that old people from West Germany went to live in East Germany because they could draw on the pensions that were generously given by the GDR to its older, old, old, older, old, older citizens. So, you know, I, I, I think one has to take all these factors. These people who call Russia and China imperialists, even South Africa, even Brazil, even India. So who is left in the non-imperialist world? All these imperialist countries, who are they exploiting? What do they live off? The whole point of, of imperialism is it lives off the exploitation, not only of its own working class, but also of people abroad. There'll be nobody left outside of the imperialist camp. They'll all be imperialists. Who are they, who are they trying to oppress and exploit? Uh, you know, you don't have to have great theoretical acumen and knowledge to come to that conclusion. Just look at the numbers. Just look at the number of people in, in, in all, all these countries. It doesn't make sense. And I think they just, people who are putting forward that line, I think they've gone out of their mind. They need to have their brain examined, you know. <laughs> and they, they've got to go back to reading Lenin's imperialism properly. Not reading, studying it, understanding it. It's one thing to read, like, like as Lenin was very fond of saying, Gogol's Petrushka, who could read words but not understand their meaning. You know, Lenin has written a very profound book, as indeed every one of his works is profound. So it's, it's, it's childish of me to say Lenin's book on imperialism is profound. All his writings, to my view, uh, very profound, whether they're on, on philosophy, economics, politics, war, ev ev everything. And so if you make a study of it, you cannot call Russia an imperialist country. You cannot call Ch China an imperialist country. And they're trying to assert their independence. They're trying to develop their own economies. And as far as I'm concerned, I wish them well. I wish them success. Uh, if it means that certain groups in Europe, sitting in the comfort of their homes, drinking wine or schnitzel and sitting behind the computers waging, if, if you like, a war through the computers, well, that's fine, fine with them. But in the real world, the war, the war has to be fought and it's got to be fought against imperialism in the interests of the people, including the people in, 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 in the imperialist countries. We've got to persuade them that they must not follow their own, own ruling class and I think time is coming when they will. The European working class has been deluded since the Second World War. It's a very special era, which brought certain amount of prosperity. Uh, and, and, and it brought what we call the Keynesian consensus, where the bourgeoisie was able through propaganda and that development to persuade the working class, they were much better off under capitalism. Why bother about the social, social, socialist um, uh, 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 re re revolution, but the cons the, that consensus broke in the mid mid seventies, and since then things have been going uh, not very well for him in imperialism. But of course, it's a very strong system. It takes longer than a decade or two decades to bring it down, but it will. The European working class is like a sleeping lion. You know, once it wakes up, it would be very difficult to control. Yeah, that's a, a very good point uh, to um, yeah, get to the next question, and that is um, the fight against imperialism and the fight 
the against imperialism uh, also in our countries that are within the imperialist centers. Uh, you've mentioned uh, that there needs to be a, a broad uh, or a wide anti-imperialist uh, uh, front and also that uh, countries like Russia and China play a, a huge role. So um, maybe you could uh, talk a bit uh, about the tasks for not only uh, the communist movement, um, but also within uh, the peace movement and uh, within the working class struggle uh, for the anti-imperialist fight that is ahead of us in the next years. I think one of the first things that the communist movement must do is in each country, in the centers of imperialism, the proletarians must build a properly revolutionary communist party, which is guided by the revolutionary theory of Marxism-Leninism. As Lenin never ceased to point out, without a revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. And secondly, they must build disciplined parties. Without, without organization, the proletariat has, has nothing. It can only win. You know, the proletarians don't fight individually. They're not like petty bourgeois. They're not fighting on the strength of their brains and uh, as, as individuals. They fight because they are guided by a revolutionary theory and they have a strong centralized organization which practices iron discipline. Iron discipline is not something that is imposed by force or something. It is something that comes voluntarily. People who join the party understand the importance of that discipline without which they cannot move, move, move an inch. That is the most important part. Secondly, as far as the peace movement is concerned, the peace movement in European countries is really not quite a peace movement. It's an appendage of the petty bourgeoisie and of social, social, social democracy. And we must take the message. I'm not saying you ignore them. You go there. But the message must be that the struggle against uh, war must be connected with the struggle against imperialism. Without fighting against imperialism, the peace movement will achieve nothing. It will eventually be a peace movement for imperialism and not against imperialism. We've got to make sure that the peace movement understands There can be no peace as long as imperialism lasts. Imperialism is the source of modern war, and it cannot be eliminated unless you eliminate imperialism and unless you eventually it is eliminate exploitation of one human being by another and one nation by another. That is a message, no matter how difficult it may be, that's a message we must take to the peace, peace movement. We will be unpopular. You go there, everybody will say, You're mad. You don't understand modern politics. No, they don't understand modern politics. And you've got to make sure that the working people actually get that message. Working people are not thick, but they've been deluded for quite some time. And as long as they're deluded, they continue to behave um, in, in, in a non-revolutionary way. The working class, <coughs> majority of them anyway, have very little interest in preserving the present system. Because, which every now and then not only throws them to the heap of unemployed uh, re regularly and makes misery and life miserable for them, but also thrusts them into wars and the other ones who pay the price in blood and loss of people, people's husbands, people's sons, people's children, people's parents die in those wars. Wars for what? Wars for the glory of the ruling class. And we should just say, Our enemies are at home. Our enemies are not abroad. We're not going to send our young people to slow, slaughter our <clears throat> class, class brethren across the frontiers. What reason is there, there to go and murder Germans just because they belong to uh, a country which is across the borders? Uh, it, 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 it's obvious that it makes no sense. Uh, maybe uh, you uh, for the pr uh, the bigger picture. I think it um, would be uh, good to understand uh, how we can uh, bring down the imperialist rule uh, in the world. I think for um, our file at home, uh, you've mentioned the the slogan uh, or uh, the direction of the slogan of Kalib Knecht, the main enemy is in our country but i think uh the the question that uh, is 
at least one for me is well do we support um the efforts made for example by russia in in this war uh why um by china for example uh in the bettering of uh economic development in africa or um do we focus on on the imperialist of our countries uh if that uh, was more or less a, a question that was clear well i think this this, this is the main, main job imperialism is not something abstract it exists in real practice and really the fight is both national and international we must fight against our imperialist ruling class in our own country and also collaborate and cooperate with uh, with other comrades across the our frontiers who are fighting against imperialism if i may just mention my party was one of the the parties that have initiated the formation of an anti imperialist platform and we very much like other comrades from other countries uh, there are many parties and countries admittedly they're small we don't claim that they're all very very big but you know small things can grow and big things with the wrong policy can dis- dis- disintegrate and i would very much urge comrades in germany to join up with other comrades and and and, and uh, sign up with the platform and imperialism uh, i believe it's uh, sometimes uh, ne- next month or in march a very big anti imperialist uh, platform organized conference is taking place in venezuela and caracas um, uh, and venezuelans have, have uh, are the only big party the part, party of uh, so- socialism um, in venezuela who signed signed this platform and we'd like many other parties be they big be they small be they ruling parties be they non ruling parties to sign this platform because imperialists are uniting all the scoundrels in the camp of imperialism and we must actually gather together all the revolutionaries under under this 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 platform and it allows you the freedom to discuss your differences within that front as long as you're committed to fighting against imperialism and its statement is i think available on the website you can look at it um, and and uh, it's not very long and if you are able to subscribe to it um i can only request you to sign it thanks for introducing uh, the world anti imperialist uh, platform to us because we we already um look very deeply into what what was um, published there and we are also in in discussion about uh, the platform and um i would like to to ask some some further questions on uh, the war in ukraine um i mean you mentioned um, some points about the motives of uh, the russian federation in this war and we had uh, long and deep discussions about um the question of uh, strategy and tactics in in uh, of the re- revolutionary parties and um one question to us was um about the overlap um of the interests of the russian working class with the national bourgeoisie uh, whether this is possible and if uh, the a uh, russian working class can take profit out of uh, this overlap of interests well the overlap of interests only comes when it comes to defeating imperialist intervention in russia and the attempt by imperialism to have a re- regime change in, in 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 russia but after that war is won the working class obviously has its own policy the working class will pursue its own interest and we're very happy that it will fight for its interests and fight against russian Uh, uh, bourgeoisie but in my view now in the middle of this war is 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 is, is, is not is, is not not the time i'm not trying to tell the russian working class what to do but i think at the moment all there's nothing wrong w- w- with the russian working class joining forces with the russian bourgeoisie to defeat imperialism that that that's our view but you don't have to accept that and we also read uh, one um, statement of a communist organization from ukraine that said that the aim of the ukrainian working class should be 
to turn the weapons onto their own uh, bourgeoisie at the moment in this war. And um, I'm asking myself if this is really um, the aim for the working class in Ukraine at the moment at, uh, in this kind of situation where like the main um, communist party in, in uh, Ukraine is forbidden and uh, um, the unions um, are so weak. And so I would like uh, to ask you about um, what do you think, uh, what is uh, in the interest of the Ukrainian working class at the moment? As far as I'm concerned, the people who subscribe to that line that you have just described, comrade, are the ones who say it's an inter-imperialist inter war. We do not accept that it's an inter-imperialist war. It is a war waged by NATO using the Ukrainian people who are losing lives to fight NATO's war against, against Russia and subsequently in days to come against China. So people who are issued these, these statements in U Ukraine, they don't actually live in Ukraine. They are very, very few living in Paris and issuing these statements under the influence of one or two other organizations, which are much bigger, big, bigger than them, who got a wrong policy. And they think it's revolutionary. There's nothing revolutionary in this because a, a person who in a political struggle is frightened of always looking over his shoulders and saying, who will criticize them is never going to succeed. You have to have an independent policy. You've got to decide what exactly is in the interest of the working class. And you must put, put forward that policy boldly, fearlessly, and relentlessly. That's the only, only way, way, way to carry on. Uh, well, well, the, 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 the Ukrainian working class is completely suppressed. You know, the people who have resisted that policy most are in the south and east of, of the country. Um, and and, and, and if, if the Ukrainians are asked, we're going to be asked to turn their guns, they should be asked to turn their guns against the Azov Battalion against the Zelensky regime, people who are actually conducting this war as, a, as mercenaries on behalf of imperialism, that would be something very useful. It's not against their own bourgeoisie. It is against people who are trying to embroil us into uh, the Ukrainian people into, into, into a war, war against, against Russia. And they should make uh, uh, agreements with any of those who would follow that policy and who would want to oppose this war by NATO and using the Ukrainian people. I have tremendous sympathy with the Ukrainian people. These are the very same people who gave millions to the Red Army as soldiers, gen gen generals in the Red Army, officers in the, in, the, in the Red Army. And the people who rule today are the ones who were quizlings, who were fighting on behalf of German imperialism, the Banderaites and, and, and people of, of, of that ilk. That is the, these are the people against whom the guns should be turned. They're fascists. And in Western Europe, it said, how come the regime be fascist? Because the head of the government is, is, is a Jewish person. Well, my own view is any person, whatever their religion or ethnic affiliation, can be a fascist. Fascism is not connected with race. Fascism is a policy that is followed by the imperialist ruling class, class in crisis. And the Ukrainians, of the very people who were actually banned by the United States Congress, the Azov Regiment, the Suburbo, the, the Right se Sector Party, they are now become darlings of imperialism. They suddenly, <clears throat> because these are the only people who are prepared to be hard guns on behalf of imperialism. It's got nothing to do with, with religion. It's fascism is an ideology of the ruling, ruling class in, 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 in crisis when it cannot rule by the so-called democratic methods. It then rules by naked terroristic force. That's an ideology, and Jews can indulge in it as as much as people of any other religious affiliation or no affiliation at all. Also, an open question for our organization is: I mean, it's it's quite difficult to talk about what will happen in the future. But what would you say uh, would a pushback of the USA? Uh, by a Russian victory mean for the international balance of power? A defeat of NATO would weaken imperialism 
and it would lead to the disintegration of NATO in a very short period after its defeat. Um, that's an interesting point. Thanks um, for your view on that. And maybe for um, finishing that topic on the war in Ukraine, I would like uh, to ask you to repeat uh, your what uh, what's on your opinion the central task for communists in Western countries. I mean, you you mentioned, for example, the work you do in the uh, World Anti-Imperialist Platform and uh, the focus on uh, on like the uh, own um, imperialists in our countries, but um, maybe it would be good uh, to to um, mention the key points um, to us again. Well, well, as far as working class is concerned, its task, first of all, is to build Marxist-Leninist parties, which have a revolutionary theory of Marxism-Leninism, and they have strong, centralized um, organization, communist party on democratic central lines. That is the main thing. As regards working in the peace movement is concerned, it is to actually take the message that there can be no peace until and unless imperialism is fought and defeated. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's implicit in what I have said, but the basic thing to really stress is imperialism does not seek freedom and liberty, it seeks domination. Domination in its internal policy and determin domin domination in its external policy. You know, monopolization of the economy at home and monopoly of power everywhere else. Okay, unfortunately, we couldn't bring uh, this interview with Harper Bra uh, to, a, uh, to an end uh, because uh, the internet connection wasn't working well. Um, and uh, I just want to repeat the points that uh, Harpal Bra mentioned about the central task of uh, us communists in Western countries, because I think it's really important to talk and think about that. And uh, he mentioned um, on the one side um, the actions they do in the anti-imperialist struggle with um, creating the world anti-imperialist platform and um, connecting um, parties that are fighting against anti-imperialism and on the other side building uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, re revolutionary parties and um, I think these are two tasks that also a uh, communist organization is uh, taking part of and um, I would really like to thank um, Harpal Bra for his time and for his interview, the interesting points he mentioned, and I think we can learn uh, so much from him. And I hope that we can continue our uh, interview and the discussion with him in the future. Thanks and goodbye. Well, thank you for taking the trouble to interview me and, uh, and hope to speak to you another time. Kommunistische Organisation Podcast Musik